going to do is talk about this article, What Are Friends For? by Barbara Smuts. And we're going to be going into sort of tacking through that article as a way of talking about primatology in general and primate evolution. So we're going to be spending a lot of time kind of going back and forth between the details of that article and different groups of monkeys and apes and evolutionary trees and stuff that if I had a textbook, I'd be giving to you from a textbook. Um, you can look up some of this stuff on the internet if you don't trust me, but I think I got it pretty right. Um, so uh, that's what we're gonna be doing for the first part of class. That'll probably actually take us all the way to our break. The next stuff will be a little bit uh, faster. Uh, the classifications as humans as primates. We'll go into the Holly Dunsworth article on common ancestry. Um, and then we'll get to what we're going to be talking about a whole bunch of different monkeys and apes and non human primates. And you might be like, what? Why are we studying all these different kinds of? primates and their relationships to humans in an anthropology class. And the big, big point that if we get nothing else out of this is just to give you a sense of how diverse and varied and flexible the non-human primate world is. And if the non-human primate world is so diverse and varied and flexible, then when it comes to the human primate, we shouldn't expect that there's going to be some sort of hardwired hard nature that is determining our actions since we can see so much different stuff going on in the larger primate world. So that's where we'll get to at the end of class. But as you can tell, we have a long road to get there. So. I want to start off with the baboons. And over the years, I've finally developed this alliterative sequence, which is to watch out or beware getting bamboozled by reading about baboons. And the reason I say that is, is that we often, or I think, a lot of the times we come into an anthropology class and we think, aha, anthropology, I know what's gonna happen here. We're gonna read about some monkeys and apes. And the whole point of it is that those monkeys and apes are a lot more like us than I thought, because it all goes back to the apes. And so, you know, they're just like us. Not true, or I should say, it's different. And so the first point I want to make is that Barbara Smuts was not studying that these baboons because they were just like us or because they're evolutionarily close to humans. Now, the baboons are classified as old world monkeys. And so they are closer to humans than what we call new world monkeys. So I wanna pause for a second here on this distinction that we make between old world monkeys and new world monkeys. Now, one of the things about this is, is that um, the terms old world and new world are actually a little bit out of date in the sense that what they refer to is the Americas and, the, and Eurasia. And so the people in Europe called themselves the old world and they called the Americas the new world. Um, and so some people, we may, not be, be, we may not be up on that terminology and that terminology probably should be updated anyway because it's a little bit, it's in itself a little bit ethnocentric. But I want to just show you a map of what we're talking about here. When we are thinking about um, what we call the old world, this was mostly what people in Europe called themselves. 
but we're actually talking when we're talking about the primates about what's happening in Africa and to a certain extent in Eurasia, but primarily what's happening in Africa. So that's what we're gonna be calling the old world monkeys. New world monkeys refers to the kind of monkeys you will find in the Americas. And so this is a pretty big separation you'll see, a continental separation between the old world monkeys and the new world monkeys. So uh, these new world monkeys are in the order of, or the, the uh, suborder of the, what is called the platyrenes, also known as the flat-nosed primates. We'll see some pictures of these in a little bit. They got classified in part because of their noses, um, but they, like I said, the technical scientific term for them is the platyrenes, also known as the, or I mean the, the New World monkeys. They are all tree dwellers. They are all arboreal. And in general, they're going to be of smaller body size than most of our old world monkeys and certainly all of our apes. Some of the platyrenes have grasping tails, what we know of as prehensile tails, tails that can curl around and grip onto things, which makes sense because they are adapted for life in the trees. They have been evolving in the Americas, in what was called the New World, separately from other primates from about around 40 million years ago, which is quite a long time. It's hard to imagine how long 40 million years is, but it's a long, long time. And so what happens is, is that, and you know, there's some debates about how exactly these monkeys ended up in the Americas. A lot of people believe in what is called the rafting hypothesis, which is that they kind of drifted over on a large, to call it a raft is kind of a strange word. These, uh, a lot of debris can get, uh, can get almost become a sort of moving land mass and that, that, that it floated over into the Americas. So there's some debate about how they got into the Americas, but we do know that they have been evolving in, on their own tracks and diverging and doing all their monkey things separately for about 40 million years. Now, I want to pause here again. This is an important point. We'll talk about it at various times. The monkeys that we see today are not going to be the same monkeys that were around 40 million years ago. And so they have changed and they have been evolving too. It's not like they just got stuck because they, were, uh, they came over to the Americas. They kept on evolving as monkeys. Here's a few of their, a few, a few examples of New World monkeys or platyrenes. Um, like I said, generally smaller. You can see there's a little prehensile tail going on. Um, I don't know if I should call these monkeys goofy, but they're just kind of funny. They're small and screechy and they're always around in the trees. And so sometimes I can understand if somebody goes into South America or goes down into Panama and sees some of these monkeys around and says, I just can't see it. I can't see the evolutionary linkages. Yeah, you can kind of understand because they're pretty distant. Some people say, or I think some people say that the New World monkeys are more evolutionary distant from their old world monkeys than our old world monkeys from humans. That is to say, there's a pretty long, there's a pretty big separation between the new world monkeys and even their, their cousins over in the old world. We're known as the catarines. 
Again, old world monkeys. Um, so we had the flat nosed primates. These are known as sharp nosed primates. And uh, they have sharper noses. <laughs> Many of these are arboreal or adapted to life in the trees. Primates life, eating fruit and things like that was first adapted for life in the trees. But some of them have become terrestrial. That is, some of them have become ground dwellers. None of the catarines, none of the old world monkeys have prehensile tails. And in general, they have a larger body size than what we saw with the, uh, the new world monkeys. Actually, this what is called a parv order of the catarines includes as subgroups, old world monkeys, the apes, and also the humans. And one of the reasons it includes those three groups is there is a shared dental formula across these three groups. All old world monkeys, all apes, and all humans have a shared dental formula where you have incisors, canines, premolars, and molars of two incisors, two one canine, two premolars, and three molars. So it's kind of evolutionarily interesting. We see a different dental formula with the new world monkeys, but in the old world monkeys, apes and humans, they all share this dental formula across this group, and that's why in some ways they're grouped together as the Catarines. These creatures, uh, for the most part, all, a lot of this evolution happens in Africa. And so there was a divergence again around 40 million years ago between the new world monkeys and the old world monkeys, the ones that were in Africa uh, went on their evolutionary paths uh, to a certain extent across the continent of uh, Eurasia, um, but uh, most of this evolution uh, stuff is happening in Africa. So here's a picture of some, some old world monkeys. And as you can tell, they are, you know, some of them are sitting on the ground, no prehensile tails, a little bit larger. There's our, our Baboon, one of the baboons, some baboons are more terrestrial, some are more arboreal. Um, they are a little more serious than those goofy other New World monkeys. You can see that there's starting to be a little bit more, you're know, like, aha, it's starting to look a little more familiar. So the old world monkeys, going back to what we are notes on what Smuts was doing, the old the, the baboons are old world monkeys. And so they are closer to humans than those new world monkeys, which are pretty distant. But they're not nearly as close as the apes. So if we have our old world monkey, new world monkey divergence around 40 million years ago. We have an ape-monkey divergence in basically in, in Africa, in the old world, in Eurasia, uh, around 30 million years ago, where some of these creatures started to go off on their own evolutionary line as apes. Oh, by the way, what's the best way, quickest way to tell apes from monkeys? Yes. Lack of tail. Lack of tail. Apes don't have tails. So uh, that's usually how we know. That's a quick, quick way. So we have an ape monkey divergence around 30 million years ago. We'll talk about some, some, of, the, some of the apes. And then the last common ancestor, most people are pinning this, uh, between chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans is at about six to eight eight to 10 million years ago. Let's say eight million years ago, just to be on the fun side, give or take two million. 
these things, I mean, it's not, it's not like one day you wake up and you become something else. This is a, a process and it's kind of a messy process and creatures go off and they go, go into their own habitat and they evolve there for a while and then they might meet back up with some of their, their people who are starting to look a little bit different, but they still can interbreed. And so you get some hybridization and some, you know, these things are not, they don't happen all at once. It's not like there's some line, you wake up and all of a sudden I'm a chimpanzee and I've turned into a human, as we'll see. It doesn't work that way. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, evolution is messy. But the point is that uh, going back to Smuts, uh, Barbara Smuts's work, she's not really studying these baboons because they're just like us. They're pretty distant from us, right? We have a, a, the ape monkey, old world divergence around 30 million years ago, and they've been evolving around. Let me show you this in kind of chart form. Again, if we had a textbook, you could probably look at this in a textbook, but you have, uh, I'll, I can send you the link on this, you have a long, uh, a long divergence around 50 to 50 to 60 million years ago between these lemurs and tarsiers. There's our new world monkey, old world monkey divergence. They're putting it at about 45 million years ago. Then we have an old world monkey ape divergence. Did I get that one right? They're saying about 25 million years ago, pretty close. And then we have the apes. So the gibbons kind of go off on their doing their gibbon thing. And then you have a divergence between what would lead to orangutans and gorillas. And a final, uh, the, like I said, last common ancestor between uh, chimpanzees, bonobos, and humans is probably at about six to eight million years ago. If we zoom in a little bit on the, the ape side of things, so again, orangutans doing their orangutan thing at about 12 million years ago, gorillas branching off. And when I say branching off, right, it's that they start to adapt to different habitats and they start to lose reproductive capacity with creatures that may have looked like them. All these creatures continue to evolve in their own ways. The gorillas of today are not going to be like the gorillas of 10 million years ago. They may have changed a lot. They might be kind of similar, but you know, they've changed in different ways. Again, the last common ancestor, most people know about the chimpanzees because we've heard about them. Fewer people know about the bonobos. Bonobos are, are rarer, and there was a separate branching off, a separate speciation process that began to happen about 2 million years ago between bonobos and chimpanzees. So they were once thought to be part of the same species. We now know that they are not the same species, but that speciation process happened after the human bonobo chimp split. So in effect, we are equidistant between humans, bonobos, and chimps because who knows, are we more like, is the last common ancestor more like a chimpanzee of today or more like a bonobo of today or not like any of the three? We don't exactly know. We probably think it's more like a bonobo or a chimp than it is like a human, but it's hard to tell which of these would be our, our last ancestor. Any questions about these kinds of branching processes and all these different, different primates? We're getting a sense of how complicated this stuff can be, right? Uh, you know, I again, I recommend, you know, poking around on the internet for some of these, you know, some footage and some pictures and different, uh, different ways to think about this. This is a pretty uh, recent article from, from Nature, which details these, these branchings. All right, so now let's go back to our question, which is why 
why was he studying baboons? What was he doing then if they weren't evolutionarily close to humans? And this gets a little bit complicated. I mean, she was probably there just doing basic primatological observations. But in this article, what she's really talking about or what she wants to uh, empirically think about uh, to try and work through is what she calls the dominance hypothesis. Um, and uh, specifically, this is on uh, page 38, and then she revisits this at the end of her article on page 44. Uh, the dominance hypothesis, uh, which is basically, I would say, the, the male dominance hypothesis for family origin. And for me, I, how to say, this is something that is kind of with us from television and just media and our popular stereotypes about the world. To call it a hypothesis to me seems to elevate it up to some scientific level where I don't actually think it even belongs. But since it is so prevalent and there are so many scientists who, you know, are willing to try and make our popular stereotypes into hypotheses, we have to have it as the hypothesis. Basically, if I could sum up the dominance hypothesis, it's that you have the females of the species are out there and they are the passive objects. They, they, their thing is they just have offspring and they have offspring uh, based on male competition and, the males compete among themselves for access to females, but the females don't really have anything to do with it. So that there's a dominance hierarchy established and the highest ranking males get to have offspring with the females, but the females are just, you know, sort of sitting there waiting for the males to work out their dominance routines. And so in this scenario, the males of the species become all protective of their females. They have to be all aggressive. They have to be providers. And, you know, again, a, the stereotypes, that's where we get the, uh, the males bringing home bacon and supplies for the females. And that out of this scenario, let's say that you're the male who's won this dominance competition and you have a female sitting at home, the one thing you don't want to have happen is to have some other monkey coming in and taking your female while you're not there. So the idea is that the males of the species, because of their what they're doing, providing socioeconomic benefits, are then demanding sexual exclusivity so that they can guarantee paternity. They you know that you're, you're, the kids are your kids, that there's genetic paternity involved and that there hasn't been any monkeying around while you weren't at home, while you were out getting the, hunting the stuff. And so the idea is that male dominance in this competition leads us to where we are today with monogamy and stable nuclear families, mom, dad, two kids. It all goes back to this idea of the baboons. Or I mean, what it all goes back into our primate heritage. So again, this is the dominance hypothesis. And if you had to look for a good test of the dominance hypothesis, baboons would be a really good way to test your hypothesis. So what do we learn about the baboons that makes them so great to test our hypothesis? Juliana, what do you learn about the baboons? What are they like? What's, what's, their, uh, what's their mating pattern? Like 
take it while those nails can grow and leave so that like it makes them get complicated with being in if they get jealous. They get jealous, that is true. But in general, are they a mate for life kind of species? No. We use a no. word to describe them, which is they're promiscuous, right? Now, one of you objected to the word promiscuous, and I agree when we think of the word promiscuous, we usually think of as indiscriminate, right? Sleeping with a bunch of people. However, as uh, Barbara Smuts points out, they are promiscuous, but it is not random. As Juliana has told us, there is there are patterns involved. It's not a mate for life thing, but it's not random either. And one of the other interesting things about this is, is the amount of time uh, that they are uh, having uh, as several of you put it and found interesting about this, they have specific mating times. So they're not having sex all the time. They're only having sex during what we call estrus or perhaps in the old days used to call outdated term being in heat when the female is reproductively receptive. And so that's when they're going to have uh, have have, uh, have uh, sexual intercourse. So it's good because if you're trying to observe creatures that they're you know in, during specific times, uh, it's nice to it's nice to know what's going on during those times. The other thing about the baboons are is they are very aggressive. They're very strong and the males have, the canines are sharper than lions, which is uh, pretty, uh, pretty dramatic. Not only that, they're not afraid to use those teeth. And Smuts reports that, you know, on average, there's about a slash wound on a female about once a year. And there's a pretty big difference of body size in that the males are averaging about twice as large as the females, which is again, pretty dramatic. So just remember, this is not like us. No, this is not, this is not the bar scene. This is, uh, this is a different kind of thing. But it is a very good way to test out male dominance hypothesis, right? All these things are a good way to figure out what's going on with the male dominance hypothesis. Now, I want to pause here for a second and talk about this last point, which is uh, sexual dimorphism or primate sexual dimorphism by body size. What is the general uh, difference between body size of, uh, of males and females of a species when it comes to primates. Some primates, uh, some, uh, and we're going to be talking here especially about the apes, are about the same size. Gibbons, for example, that we saw branching off the evolutionary, uh, branching, taking their own branch off the evolutionary tree, the gibbons as an ape, are about the same size males and females. There's uh, hardly any body size sexual dimorphism. There are some species of apes in which the males are a little bit larger on average than the female, about eight to 15% larger than the female. Humans, chimps and bonobos. So in not a huge surprise perhaps because uh, here are our closest uh, primate relatives, our closest uh, ape relatives, and we all have about the same uh, average uh, sexual dimorphism. Um, there are some apes in which the, the males are, are a decent amount larger than females. Gorillas are about 50% larger than females on average. Although this varies a, a somewhat by what group of gorillas you're in between the lowland gorillas and the mountain gorillas. 
but there's a, a more pronounced sexual dimorphism there. And then as we've just seen, there are some that have some even more pronounced sexual dimorphism in body size, uh, which, is, which the baboons are a case of that. What I want you to note here is that there is a lot of variation. Uh, some of them range from pretty much being the same by species, uh, some of these vary by group. And then there's individual variation within a species. Um, with humans, we also have different societies, different historical epochs uh, in which uh, human uh, body size dimorphism has been different depending on cultural customs and what people are feeding to growing boys and girls. Um, so this can vary as well uh, by society or by group as by group. And I'd also, uh, if we look around, we could glance around the room and we can also come to the realization that it's not that all the males, just because there's an average size differential, that doesn't mean that all the males are going to group up at 8 to 15 percent larger than all the females. No, there's going to be an overlap. And so that, you know, there are individual females that are larger than individual males. It's just that if you took this all as a, as a large group, you'd have this, uh, the, the size discrepancy there. Now, obviously, with the baboons, you know, the males are are going to be quite a bit larger than the females all the time. Uh, but with humans, chimps, and bonobos, there's going to be a, a, a good individual range as well as, a, as, as, an, as an average differential. So let's talk about the findings, what she found, the, the findings of our study the surprises, you might say. Kyle, what did she find here? The females are, are they the passive objects of male competition? <laughs> All right, so the first thing is, you know, I mean, obviously the male competition has a role, if you get slashed by another male, it's probably going to be hard to be chosen by the female. But yeah, it's rather surprising how much the females can, you know, have some maneuver in this, have some choices and preferences uh, in the system. And then we find also perhaps surprising how much, oh, well, Evan, what were you surprised by here? What was your surprise in the article, Evan? You had the female choice and preference, and then just the fact that the baboons. So you're expecting a lot different, then you found the friend stuff. Yeah, that they were socially organized in some yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, we have to be careful here. We can't ask them who their friends are and we can't check their Facebook status, but she's defining friendship here by how much they groom each other and what patterns they have and how close they are to each other. So again, you have to be careful to, we can't check into their feelings or talk to them, but we can use uh, measurements to figure out that certain, certain baboons were grooming and, and doing, uh, doing things with, with other baboons. Um, one of the interesting factors is, is that the, it turns out that the, older males in the group, not necessarily the most dominant males, end up having the having more friends. Of course, what does the uh, 
what do the what does the what's the benefit for the females of having the male friends? Allison, what do you what do you get about that? Uh, so the females benefit from having the male friends because they have like added protection, and the male could take care of the female's infants if the female stopped caring for the baby. Okay, so added protection, or you know, we have these aggressive and aggressive behaviors. So you get the friendship benefits for the females. You get protection for them and the offspring. You get access to their resources and feeding spots, and you also get some infant care, care for the baby. And perhaps I guess the most surprising thing about this. Well, Nicole, what, who are these infants? Sometimes it's the male's offspring, but half of the time it's not. Yes, more well put. It could be genetically related, but it might not be. And it's actually more likely that you're going to get infant care from a male friend than simply just because of a genetic relationship. So the friend is more likely to provide infant care than a paternal, uh, an actual, uh, I guess, uh, the, the biological father, you might say. Now you might wonder, well, then <laughs> what it sounds Sounds like the females are getting a good deal out of the, the male friendship. Uh, Barbara Smuts speculates, and I think later studies have, have confirmed some of this, that the male friends may get an increase in their mating chances later on. So it's not necessarily a, a proximate cause of friendship, but it does play out over time in that uh, they can get, get an increase in their mating chances. So we have a, a test case for the dominance hypothesis. We have some interesting findings here about baboon structure and what's going on, uh, perhaps different than, than we might have suspected. And so we come back now to the to the support or the falsification of the hypothesis. Are the male dominance ideas supported? Mackenzie, what would you say? I would say no. Um, there's evidence that they wish they were, <laughs> but when it comes down to it, it's more of an equality, equality more of a, um, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, so they're both benefiting from their relationships. I would say no. I would say no too. I'd even say no with like a big three exclamation points no. And she makes three points about this, which is that, uh, and this is from page 44, that what the baboons show is that you can have these long-term social bonds. You can have friendships that last, or you know, creatures that hang out together and groom each other and are close together, without necessarily having uh, you know the males going off and doing one type of food gathering and the and the females doing another and then coming to so having some sort of division of labor between the sexes or having to uh, have food sharing between say hunters and gatherers so you can have long-term social bonds without a a a necessary economic what we might call an economic component as some of you said that you can have friendship without necessarily having demanding sexual exclusivity, or you could have friendship without necessarily having sex. Um, that that can, is not necessarily overlapping. And that you can have males as parents being 
what we might would call fathers without necessarily having or needing to have biological genetic paternity. So indeed, are baboons great test case for male dominance because there's a lot of male dominance going on in this primate group, but they don't confirm our expected male dominance outcomes. And so a lot of times, a lot of times people look back or look across at primates because they want to see something from human society that they want to confirm, either because they want to confirm it in our evolutionary past or they want to look over and say, aha, that's, that's what all primates do. That's the natural thing. And most of the time, you can probably find whatever behavior you're looking for, but if you turn to another primate group, you'll find that they do something different. And so people like to want to confirm things like the nuclear family or monogamy uh, by looking back at the primates and it's just not there. And so the idea that the family develops from a male dominance model is not supported by primatology or by, our, by some of our, our primate relatives.